أفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا أفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا إلافا كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد The Quran, the words of Allah, the miraculous words of Allah سبحانه وتعالى It's an obligation on every Muslim to ponder over the verses of the Quran to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبر آياته وليتذكر أول الألباب that this is a blessed book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for what purpose? For the people to ponder over its verses. And pondering over the verses of the Qur'an means that we would act according to the Qur'an, acting according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from the believers to submit themselves totally, without any condition. And that's why we need to spend the time to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. The pure revelation, the never distorted revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till the day of judgment, that it has the power and the might in it that nobody would ever be able to defeat the power of the Qur'an. And that's why we need to hold fast to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We reached verse number 83 in Surah Al-Baqarah. Verse number 83 in Surah Al-Baqarah. And again we're going one verse or few verses at a time. And the purpose of that is to get to know the benefits, to get to know the meanings of the verse. And then the benefits that we need to take from the verse in practicality and how to live the Qur'an in our daily life, how to speak, how to act, how to submit ourselves fully and totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ This verse is about Bani Israel, the children of Israel, as the context of the verses before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا And remember, when we took from Bani Israel their covenant, their mithaq, لا تعبدون إلا الله Do not worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وبالوالدين إحسانا And to be kind to the parents. وذي القربة And the kindred. واليتامة And the orphans. والمساكين And the poor. وقولوا للناس حسنا And speak what is good to people. وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة. Establish the salah and pay the zakah. ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْكُمْ But then you slid back except a few among you. وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ While you are back sliders. What is the meaning of this verse? As we heard this is a covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We get to know the meanings first and then we need to reflect when it comes to the benefits for us to learn individually so that we save ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we gain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by submitting ourselves to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. The meaning as we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant from Bani Israel. And mithaq, which is covenant, means something of a promise that is done by a heavy oath. And this is not just between two human beings together. 
This is between the human being and the creator of the heavens and the earth. The most merciful, the almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذْ As we remember means and remember. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا When we took Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that took the covenant, the heavy covenant with oath from Bani Israel. أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَ Bani Israel, The children of Israel, Ya'qub alayhi salam. What is this mithaq? What is this covenant? The covenant is, as we heard, orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something, as we will see inshallah ta'ala, it is not just for Bani Israel, not just for the children of Israel. This covenant was taken from the ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they fulfilled this covenant. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the early generations of Islam, Till today, they're always going to be a group among the ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There is always on the truth and always fulfilling the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if there is a portion of the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that would slide back and would be in state of forgetfulness, this is the nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed his bounty on that they would carry the message of the truth till the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the covenant from Bani Israel. And as we heard before, that the children of Israel, they turned away from the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it's mentioned from the verse, except a few of them. And as a result of that, as it's mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed them and they changed and distorted the books and the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their hearts became hard. And we talked about that before. And this is a real punishment. This is the worst punishment that can happen to an individual on the face of earth. It's not a lightning from the skies. It's not death. It is not destruction. The worst punishment that can happen unto an individual or a nation on the face of earth is for their hearts to be hard. For them to be deprived from seeking and from knowing and seeing the guidance. For them to be steadfast on what is corrupt and what is evil. This is the worst punishment. This is the punishment that the believers should fear so much that if they would break the covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they took with the heavy oath, then the punishment is the same. Why? Because the sunnah, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never changes. It was for Bani Israel and it's also for this ummah, the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِي أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ It's not by your wishes or the wishes of the people of Bani Israel. So what is this covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from Bani Israel, that they should abide with these orders and live their life accordingly, and it is similar, as we mentioned, with regarding to the covenants to this ummah. The first thing, and let's ponder over it and pay attention, so that we make sure that we are fulfilling these orders exactly the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. لا تعبدون إلا الله This is the first thing. Do not worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, لا تعبدون إلا الله It's basically لا إله إلا الله. And this is the meaning of لا إله إلا الله which is the first pillar of Islam. لا, none, إله meaning the one to be worshipped and that's why here تعبدون. That's why إله does not mean the creator, does not mean the provider. It means the one to be worshipped. <coughs> and that's of course that when we uh, see that the only creator is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only provider, this is of course, there's no doubt about that. But when we talk about the meaning of la ilaha illallah, meaning there is no one worthy of worship. It's talking about worship. Most of the human beings, they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, is the sustainer, is the provider. But when it comes to acts of worship, who do they worship? Who do they turn to at their times of ease and times of difficulties? Is it a saint? Is it a saint? Is it a messenger of Allah? Is it a pious person? Is it angels? Or is it the creator of the heavens and the earth alone? So the meaning of La ilaha illallah, it means there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we see here, the Quran explains itself. La ta'buduna illallah. If you take ta'buduna and you put ilaha, it gives you La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah, which means that ilah, Means what? Means the one to be worshipped. Ilah means the one to be worshipped. And this is what every messenger was sent to his people. 
to call the people to this fact. And that's why when we understand La ilaha illallah in the proper way, we would see that among the Muslims today, there are people that practicing things that would negate the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Because when we say the only one worthy of worship, and worship is anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered, dua is worship as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, dua huwa al-ibadah. The dua is the ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Qur'an to make dua to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we see that some Muslims today, they would make dua, they would call into someone that is deceased in his grave, a saint or whatever. This is definitely an act of shirk, associating partners with Allah, negates la ilaha illallah. Because la ilaha illallah means there is no one worthy of worship, and dua is a worship. And the same thing when it comes to slaughtering. The same thing that it comes with vows and so on and so forth. So this is a clear evidence and I hope that we learn this lesson and the benefit very clearly that the only one worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated in the verse لا تعبدون إلا الله And تعبدون here is in the present tense which means at all times not just at a certain time or a certain place at all times the only one worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah, the word Allah means the one to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. And this is also the root linguistic meaning of the word Allah, the one to be worshipped. Worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. And this is the life of the believers. To so the first covenant, لا تعبدون إلا الله Do not worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means we worship the creator of the heavens and the earth alone. And to stay away from all forms of shirk and associating partners with Allah, that would negate the meaning of La ilaha illallah. This by itself needs time to be explained, needs for the Muslim to expand over it and to get to know the forms of shirk to avoid it. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned things in it and also in the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second covenant is Wabil Waridaini Ihsan, which means and to be kind to the parents. Al Ihsan is goodness. And Al-Walidayn meaning two, the father and the mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the covenant from Bani Israel to be kind to the parents. The first one or the first covenant deals with the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tawheed, the purpose of our life, and that is to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth alone. The second covenant deals with the human beings and the most among the human beings that have rights on us are the parents. And that's why you would see in the Qur'an, in many places in the Qur'an, that comes right after the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, is to be kind to the parents. This is an act of worship. This is a covenant. It's not something that depends on how kind the parents are. It does not depend on how uh, they are treating their children. It's an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless of how the parents are dealing with their children. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the covenant from Bani Israel that it's not conditioned. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا To the extent of which that if the parents were disbelievers. And not just that. If the parents were disbelievers and they are calling the child to be a disbeliever. What the child should do should still as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered. The child should never obey them when it comes to the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Which means that if they're striving and struggling for you to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not obey them. But then still, live with them with goodness. So living with them with goodness is something that is unconditioned whatsoever. And if they would order their child to commit a sin, even if it's not shirk, if they order the child to commit a sin, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the rule that never misses whatsoever is that the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute obedience that is unconditioned. Any other obedience that comes after that, it has to be under the condition that it's part of the deen of Allah, that it's to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the parents would order the child to commit a sin, even if it's a minor sin, then the answer is they should not obey them but still to be extremely kind to them. To be kind to them as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do. And being kind to them meaning that a person is uh, protecting them from any form of harm, even if it's the slightest form of harm as it's mentioned in another verse in the Quran, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ 
which is a, uh, not even a word, but just a gesture that would show the discomfort in front of the parents, this is considered to be a major sin. So you can imagine that if a person would say evil words to them and not speak good to them. So even if a person does not say anything, this is not permissible unless the person would speak kind to the parents and treat them with all forms of goodness and kindness. And we have so many uh, incidences and we have so many quotes and so many things among the early generations of Islam that if we expand over every one of these covenants, we would see how beautifully this ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, among the righteous early generations of Islam, how they fulfilled the covenants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we should follow their footsteps and be steadfast when it comes to obeying the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to be kind to the parents, wadhil qurba, the kindred, the relatives, to be kind to them. And this is also the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a covenant. Again, it's not just a matter of rewarding one another. This is the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be kind to the relatives. And inshallah ta'ala we continue right after the break. <laughs> The Spirit of Hajj Join Sheikh Ma'in Shusa as he speaks about the true essence of Hajj, its meaning, and the wisdom behind its rituals. Hajj, brothers and sisters, has great virtues which have been narrated to us by our beloved Prophet. Whoever performs Hajj for the sake of Allah, and therein utters no evil, nor commits any evil act, would return from his hajj as the day his mother gives birth to him. That is, he would return pure from sins, as if he was just born. Al Eid is even a larger gathering of Muslims in the same town. All of these and more in the spirit of Hajj. Huda, a light in every home. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد حج step by step Hajj is a great act of worship performed by millions of Muslims every year. If you would like to know what ihram is, the types of Hajj, kinds of tawaf, permitted and forbidden acts during Hajj. Join Dr. Musa McGuire and Sheikh Mohammed Salah in his wonderful show, Hajj Step by Step. So what specifically are, are the benefits of Hajj? Performing Hajj and Umrah overcome poverty and remove sins. The permanent mahram, a person who can never marry to this woman. Uh, what is the, the first rite of Hajj? And is it accurate to say that Hajj actually begins before you even get to Mecca? The ihram of a woman actually is in her face and hands. The very first house of worship was appointed for mankind on earth is Al Kaaba. Hajj step by step, where he will explain all of that and more in the light of Quran and Sunnah. Huda, a light in every home. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Going through the covenants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from Bani Israel, and it's not just from them, but it's also from the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be kind to the parents and to the kindred, to the relatives, those who are related to us. This is something that is again an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and need, we need to make sure that we don't deal with these types of relationships based on what everybody else do. 
people do these types of relationships based on rewarding one another or based on cultures or whatever there is. But we as Muslims, we are kind to the relatives and to the poor and so on because this is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why this is important? Because of the other side, they don't treat us the same way. If they don't treat us with kindness, then the sin is on them. It does not make us entitled or it's not justified for us to treat them equally in that regard. If they treat us with injustice, we should return this unjust treatment with goodness and to be just, just with them because this is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, without acquiring any harm, definitely a person would protect oneself, but still being kind to them. Some people think that being kind to the relatives is just to call them on the phone. This is just one form. But to be kind to them is to be there for them if they need you for anything. If they need your help, if they need help, whether it's financial or they need any form of goodness, then the person should be kind to them. And waliyatama. Yatama are the orphans. Al Yatim or the orphan is the one that lost his father and he did not reach the age of puberty yet. This is the definition of an orphan according to the Sharia, according to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. So a child didn't reach the age of puberty yet and he lost his father. This is a Yatim. Yatim and orphan means that we need to give care to such a person. It, it's not necessarily something that has to do with the financial help. Of course, if he is a poor orphan, then definitely is to be kind and to help financially. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the believers to be kind to the orphans, not just financially, but in general. Why? Because they lost the support that a father would give. And it shows the importance of the family structure in Islam. And if a person die and he would leave behind him orphans, then it's the duty of the society of the Muslims to give care to the orphan with whatever means, emotional uh, support and financial support, and to have this figure in their life that they would help them in any way or form. masakin and the poor, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us to be kind to the poor, to help them financially and to treat them with kindly and to be humble when it comes to treating them and not to treat them arrogantly. Because the human being tend to be arrogant once the human being has some power or wealth. He would tend to look down at other individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering Bani Israel to be kind to the, to the poor and the orphans and so on. And this is something that is unconditioned. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna. Another covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is قُولُوا meaning say. لِلنَّاسِ husna. Say to the people what is good. Speak good to the people. See in Arabic the literal translation is say to the people what is good. Why the people is mentioned first? To show that this is something that is meant for us to pay attention to. That, new, that we need to speak to all mankind with goodness, with husna. The same thing as was mentioned ihsana to treat them with goodness. The same way when it comes to our speech. We need to make sure that this is an act of worship. This is, shows the tongue when a person speaks, whether the person is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or following one's desire. The same thing, most of the human beings, they speak to one another according to how others speak to them. If they speak to them nice, they return what is nice but with what is nice. If they speak to them in an evil way, they would return the same way. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us with an, uh, no conditions whatsoever, is that we always speak what is good. وَقُولُ لِلنَّاسِ husna. Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he said in the tafsir of the verse, that enjoining good and forbidding evil is what is good. What is good, it doesn't mean necessarily that we speak to people what they like to hear. Because sometimes the truth hurts. But we need to be truthful with others. We need to call people to the truth. We need to enjoin good and forbid evil in the nice way and in a kind way. And that should never stop us whatsoever from saying what is right and from enjoining good and forbidding evil because this is part of saying what is good. It all depends on how things will be in the hereafter. People in the hereafter will wish that others had spoke to them about what is right and what is wrong. And that's why we need to be there for others. There's no one better and sincere uh, human being to others than someone that is trying to save them from the hellfire, to make them among the people of Jannah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
if a person will call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call them to the religion of Islam, and call them to do what is good and to make them stay away from what is evil. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna. No backbiting, staying away from haram. This is all comes under this meaning. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ And establish the salah. We talked about it before. Salah is not just to be performed, but to be established. Established, that means a person would do it with full attention, with its pillars and conditions and mandatory acts and recommended acts for the men to go to the houses of Allah, to the masajid, to fill the houses of Allah as the Prophet ﷺ did and his companions. And to make this as the most important act of worship in our day and night, that we would fulfill the order of Allah and establish the salah in the most perfect way. This is the thing between us as Muslims and the disbelievers, as the Prophet ﷺ said, الْعَادُ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمُ الصَّلَةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرُ Which means the covenant, and see the word al-ahd is mentioned here. The covenant between us and them, meaning the disbelievers, is the salah. Whoever abandons it, abandons it, then he is a disbeliever. So this is the sign of the believers. If a person would say, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah," what is the proof of that? Is to establish the salah because this is the most important act of worship. Wa zakah means and give the zakah, the obligatory charity, and it's called zakah because it purifies one's wealth, it purifies one's soul. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being in such a way that we love wealth so much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from the believers that their hearts is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And it's the mercy of Allah that we are not ordered to give up all of our wealth. It's only a very small, very small portion of our wealth. If a person has enough wealth that is saved over a year, that is not his necessities, only 2.5 percent, 25 out of a thousand, which is basically very small, to help the poor and the categories of those who are entitled for the zakah, as it's mentioned in Surah At-Tawbah. This is a pillar of Islam, and this is something that we have to make sure that we do, and it's not permissible. It's haram. It's a major sin for a person to delay giving the zakah, even if it's one day. So we have to make sure that we know our dates very well, and we ask the people of knowledge. And we need to make sure that we are giving our zakah, the obligatory zakah, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered. This is some of the covenants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from Bani Israel, and there are more to come. But then what happened when this covenant has been taken from them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْكُمْ Then you turned away. التَوَلِّي تَوَلَّيْتُمْ means when a person physically turns his body away. When he gives his back to others, meaning that he does not really want to listen, that this is a form of objection, a form of turning away, not applying, not submitting, and not fulfilling the orders of Allah. So this is what they did. They turned away, illa qalila minkum, except few. And that shows the justice of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it mentioned the truth, that a few of them among them, Fulfill the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but only few. Illa qalilan minkum wa antum mu'ridun. While you are in the state of being backsliders, turning away. This is a sin to turn away from the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that is mentioned in the Quran in many verses. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbidding us from having this irad, from turning away from the deen of Islam. Actually, it's one of the things that negates the Islam of someone when a person would totally turn away from the religion. It has nothing to do with the deen of Islam. And people can do that with regarding to certain actions or certain duties or certain acts of worship. When a person is being faced with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu we should not turn away. We should not follow our desires and our cultures and what people tell us. We should follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. There's a major difference, and we need to pay attention to this point. It's very important. There's major difference between someone that would commit a sin as a result of weakness or so, and he or she would realize that this is a sin. And they know that this is an act of sin that they need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from. Differentiate that from someone that he commits the same sin, 
But he would say, he doesn't really care. Or he turns away from the fact that this is something wrong. The attitude of the heart is basically the major difference between both. And that's why the believers, if they would fall into the sin, their hearts would hurt. And they would feel the pain in their hearts that they are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they would immediately repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before their iman would decrease. That's why we need to be constantly repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. So uh, this is the verse. And these are the lessons that we need to learn from it. And if we see in Surah An-Nisa, for example, verse number 36, we would find that the same orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do the same thing. That means this is a covenant. And again, if we never pay attention to this, that this is not just any order, this is a covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we heard and we listened to the Qur'an, that the nations before, when they turned away from the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made their hearts hard. And their punishment in this life and in the hereafter. And that's why we need to be warned. But at the same time, we see that the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu is the best of all nations that ever brought to mankind. Why? Because they fulfilled the orders of, the, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of the Prophet sallallahu at the time of the early generations of Islam, as the Prophet sallallahu praised them. And from one generation to the next, as it's mentioned before, there were always going to be a group among the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu that will be always steadfast on the truth. And they would fulfill these covenants from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet sallallahu gave the glad tidings to this ummah of the Prophet So now, what is the practical benefit that we as individuals, we need to free ourselves from the blame. We need to make sure that we are taking the covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very strongly and very seriously. It is not just a play, it's not to be belittled, it's something that we need to take it very seriously. We took this covenant, somebody might say, but I didn't take any covenant, meaning I did not say with uh, the statement of an oath or something of that nature. Yes, of course we did. When we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah, this is a covenant, because you say, I bear witness. I bear witness, I see with my own eyes, I believe with my own heart that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? It means that he's the only one to be worshipped and he's the only one to be obeyed. That Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is the final messenger and that's why we take the Qur'an, this is the covenant. This is the covenant of Allah, the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to fulfill and to follow. Inshallah, we'll be right back after the break. لا يتدبرون القرآن. This program is not about the rituals of Hajj, rather about the story that is behind. Each ritual of Hajj, the Tawaf around the Kaaba has a story. The sacrifice has a story. The Sa'i between Safa and Marwa has a story. The sacrifice of Ibrahim to his son has a story. Standing in the mountain of Arafah has a story. This program is not devoted only to those who are going to Hajj, also to those who are staying at home. Now, he is to call his father to Islam, to monotheism. Later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanding Ibrahim alayhi salam to sacrifice his only son, another test. Join Imam Karim Abu Zaid in his program, Story of Hajj, as he takes us on a journey through the life of Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and teaches us the history behind each ritual of Hajj. Huda, a light in every home. Huda, 
Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. We heard the covenants from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was taken from Bani Israel. And now, what is our duty to do when we heard these covenants? We need to take the matter serious. We need to learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And how to avoid matters of shirk. And we can take the means to learn that. And there is specifics and terms to be learned. And inshallah ta'ala, this is something that will be explained also in the Qur'an. That stays away from anything that comes to the attachment of the heart to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade and the Prophet ﷺ forbade us when it comes to matters of shirk. Making any act of worship to other than Allah. That makes it easy for us to know how to practice tawheed. Ibadah, worship is any order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And all of these orders, it is not permissible to, to, to be done to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to practically uh, fulfill these covenants by enjoining good and forbidding evil. By advising those who would associate partners with Allah. Those who would go to the graves and ask those who are dead. Advising them, telling them that you are negating la ilaha illallah. Because the dua is an act of worship. And the act of worship is only to be done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if they slaughter to someone or slaughter to the jinn. Or whatever, this is an act of associating partners with Allah because slaughtering is an act of worship. And it's only to be done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they would fear that someone in their grave would harm them, this is an act of associating partners with Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to fear Him alone. And so on and so forth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to be kind to the parents, we need to do something today, tonight, at all times. Speaking nice to them. Doing whatever it takes to be kind to them. Because as it's mentioned before, there is no human being on the face of earth that has a favor unto us, an immediate favor to us. Of course, beside the Prophet ﷺ and the scholars of the religion of Islam, I'm talking about our relatives and so on, more than the parents. Why? Because they were the means for one's life. And life is so precious. And that's why this is to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to be grateful to them and to speak to them with kindness and so on. If they are dead, if they died and passed away, still... There are ways for us to be kind to them. As the Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, that it's one of the ways of being kind and righteous to the parents, is that you would be kind to their friends when they were alive. So getting to know those who are their friends, they used to be their friends, to be kind to them, to be kind to their relatives, to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their forgiveness if they died in the state of Islam. And to uh, um, extensively make dua, you can give charity on their behalf and so on. But this is an act of worship that always should stay with us. To be kind to the relatives. With nowadays uh, lifestyle that many people forget about these meanings, they would even think, and shaitan come and whispers, that if you are kind to your relatives, they would think maybe that you want something from them. Maybe that you want something materialistic for them. But still... We should not listen to the whispers of shaitan. We should connect these relationships. And after some time they would realize that you are doing this only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not seeking any materialistic thing or help from them because this is the order of Allah, to be kind to them. And the best way is to advise them and to be there and to show them the model of being a Muslim, steadfast believers and seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. They might treat you with evil. The Prophet ﷺ said, he said in the clear hadith, and this is a test for us, the one that uh, is righteous to his kindred and his relatives is not like the one that would reward them. Meaning, if they are kind to you, you're kind to them. This is known and everybody would do this. But what if they're not kind to you? What if they are being very harsh and very evil towards you? You're supposed to oppose that with being very kind to them. And this is the same thing that the Prophet ﷺ said to the man, that he came to him and he said, I have qarab, I have relatives, I'm forbearing with them, and they are treating me with injustice. And I'm kind to them, and they treat me with uh, ignorance. The Prophet ﷺ told him, that if you are doing that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will support you, and stay like that, and as if you are making them to, to take dust or sand in their mouth. We have a phone call. Uh, Brother Ahmed from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Dan? Alhamdulillah. All who the employee. Allah barakatuh. 
I'm very happy to speak to you, Sheikh, but uh, really I want to understand the meaning of the word Mithaq. And um, whenever I read the Quran, I find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, uh, say this word to Bani Israel. And after saying this word in many verses, they uh, still disobeying him, subhanAllah. Uh, so I want to uh, you to make more shade on the uh, these elements in the uh, in the verse like the qurba yatama masakin and i want to know why bani israel neglect all these uh, orders from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no zakum khair khair thank you very much assalamu alaykum wa alaykum assalam wa uh, these orders and these covenants from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we heard is was given to bani israel and they rejected this truth except few of them, as we heard in the verse. And this is something that is mentioned in many places in the Qur'an for us to be warned. And it's calling them also to embrace the religion of Islam and to follow Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and to be warned from them so that we don't fall into the same category and to be warned not to uh, befriend them and so on so that we don't fall into these types of evilness and so on. Uh, but again, going to the verse and to be kind to the relatives and the orphans, we need to do something. If we do not have the, the opportunity to be kind to the orphans, we need to take the means to do that. This is a covenant and this is an act of worship that we need to do. Some people, they would be satisfied by just giving money. The orphans, they, just, they don't need just money. We need to do what is even more, to be kind to them, to say a nice word. This is an act of worship. This is something that we would seek the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing. And the poor. And Islam has a perfect system in which if people would abide by the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you won't find the state of poverty that is present nowadays. But we have a phone call. Uh, Sister Umm Muhammad from UAE. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa barakatuh. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you uh, this one question. Sure, uh, regarding uh, this Salah, you know, prayer, okay? Hmm. I heard in the TV they say the, uh, praying for the men in Jama'ah is 27 times more hashana for men, okay? Right. For lady, we have to pray in the house, right? right? So is there any hashana for lady 27 times or no? Sure, inshallah. This is what I want to know. Sure, inshallah. Exactly. What I have to do? To pray so that I will get 27 times hachana. MashaAllah. I, I have will... to pray as early as it is or uh, uh, what I have to do. You advise right. me. I will answer inshaAllah. Jazakum Thank you very much. you understand much. my question? Yes, I understand it very well. MashaAllah. Okay, I will wait for your answer. Sure. Jazakum khairan. Wa alaikum. So, uh, so the, the, the point is that we need to practically fulfill these orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to be kind to the poor. And again, if people are paying the zakah and the optional uh, charity and taking the means, and we need to take the means, this is all acts of worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Speaking kind to others. And there's a beautiful hadith that the Prophet sallam, it's a long hadith, but in this hadith, the Prophet sallam, said to a man, uh, for example, لا تسبن أحدا. He said to a companion of the Prophet sallam, do not say evil words to anyone. The man immediately, the companion, this is how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they took this covenant. He said, since the Prophet ﷺ told me that, I've never seen or I've never said any evil word to a free man or a slave or a camel or a sheep, even animals. He controlled his tongue immediately. And this is the submission that we need to practice. Also, the Prophet ﷺ told him that if your brother uh, would, uh, would say things that is to ridicule you, of something that he knows in you, do not do the same to him because the sin is on him and not on you. Meaning that we don't deal with people just basically doing the same that they do to us. We need to be kind to, to people regardless whether they are treating us with kindness or not, but with the condition that we protect ourselves from any harm. And establishing the salah and paying the zakah. And with establishing the salah and salat al jama'ah and answering the question of the 27 times of rewards, this is yes, a fact that the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, the meaning of which that salatul jama'ah, making salah in jama'ah, is equal to 27 times when a person would pray alone. 
And the question is for the women, they pray at home. So how would they get the same rewards as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give to the men? There's a beautiful hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, which is a long one, but to give the, the, the point in the hadith that we need to mention with regarding to this point, that a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she was complaining about the same thing. And the reason actually I smile because this is a beautiful thing that uh, the, 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 the woman in Islam, she's not going after some materialistic benefit that she would say, how come the men are going out and we need to go out like them, something of that nature. Her concern is the rewards of the hereafter. And this is how men and women should compete, the poor and the rich and everybody in the society. Our competition is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the question is such a valid question, it's such a beautiful question, and the concern is absolutely valid of how the person can get the best of the rewards. So a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ with the same concern, and she said that the women would stay at home and they would take care of their husbands, and the husbands are going for the jama'at, for the salat al-jama'ah, and they're going for hajj after hajj, and they're going for jihad and fighting in the cause of Allah. And what is for the women? The Prophet ﷺ was very pleased of what she said and how, ex- how she explained her case. And then the Prophet ﷺ told her that she should inform the women behind her and all the women, and include, including those who are present today at all times, that the obedience of the wife to her husband will give her all of these rewards altogether. That means there is a job here for the Muslim wife to do, and that is to bring the tranquility and the goodness in the homes. And if the husband is the one that is, goes out and, and seek the, the, the provisions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do the salat al-jama'ah and so on, if she wants to get the same reward, then she should be kind to the husband in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, and not to obey in matters of sins, but in matters of goodness. And as the Prophet sallallahu said in the authentic hadith, which means that whoever uh, encourages people and enjoin good to people, he will have the same rewards as those who would do the good deed. So if you encourage the men in your household to go to Salatul Jama'ah and you wake them up for the Salatul Jama'ah and they go to the masjid, you are inshallah ta'ala by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are getting the same reward that they would get. It's like one ship, they would be saved together or otherwise, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He would give us all the rewards and that we make us among those who are steadfast. We have another phone call. Brother Ibrahim from Nigeria. Yeah. Go ahead. Wa alaykum as wa Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Alhamdulillah. My question is that it's on Hajj. Yes. But some of us from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. If, 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 who stops at Jeddah, we go to Mecca directly. Can we assume our Iran from Jeddah as our Mikat? No. That is my question. Sure. Thank you very much. And actually with the questions, I w- if it's related to the Quran, mashallah, is good. And also we uh, people can call as Khuda, inshallah ta'ala. But with this question, uh, to go to Jeddah, to have the Ihram, in Jeddah, this is what passed the Miqat, which is not permissible. So the Miqat is before that. So that means you need to have the state, the state of Al-Ihram in the plain. So one of the practicality things to do it is to wear the clothing in the airport, if it's easy to do that in Nigeria, wear the clothing of Al-Ihram, and you're still not in the state of Al-Ihram. Al-Ihram is a state, it's not just pieces of clothing that a person would wear. And if a person in the plane, when they would say that we're, clo- we're close to the miqat, then a person would uh, initiate the state of al-ihram and having the intentions and then start the tarbiyah from them. But not to wait till Jeddah because it's too late then. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We have another phone call. Uh, Sister Habiba from Nigeria. Go ahead, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. My question is on... Tarawih prayer. In the last 10 days of Ramadan, there is a mosque here close to our house. When it is the last 10 days of Ramadan, they don't offer Tarawih on the ground that they are going to offer Tahajud. And that there is Hadith that says 
that uh, the Prophet did not offer more than 11 rakat in Ramadan. Yes. I don't want to know whether this hadith is uh, no. It's authentic hadith. No. And if it is authentic, is it right for somebody to offer tarawih and then tahajjud in the last 10 days of Ramadan? Right. Zakum Zakum Thank you very much. Uh, because of the shortage of the time, uh, inshallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us life, we'll answer this question inshallah next week. Uh, and since it's Ramadan is already finished, so inshallah, just be patient with us inshallah till next week because there's not enough time in this episode. Uh, and uh, just finishing the program with this verse, making sure again that we, we need to fulfill the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need to witness. There are covenants here that we need to observe. And we need to read the verse again, verse number 83 in Surah Al-Baqarah. And we need to make sure that every covenant here, that we fulfill it ourselves, and to be warned from those who would disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, next time, inshallah, we'll continue with the verses in the Quran and your questions. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا فلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا